Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight on this somewhat chilly night. Uh, I'm Melissa Muscatine. I'm one of the co-owners of Politics and Prose. Um, and on behalf of my husband and co-owner, Brad Graham, and our fantastic staff, some of whom I hope you have met tonight, um, we welcome you all to this evening's author event, which we are all so incredibly excited about. I'm, I'm so glad you're all here. It's going to be a great evening. Uh, it's, it's always an honor for us to host Susan Page. She's a real favorite here at Politics and Prose for many reasons. And tonight we are happy to be able to celebrate with her the launch of her new book. It's called The Rule Breaker, The Life and Times of Barbara Walters. And it's hot off the presses, and it's already generating rave, rave, rave reviews. And who better to write about a journalistic icon like Barbara Walters than Susan Page? Some of you may know Susan is the Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today, an award-winning reporter who's covered presidential politics through seven administrations and even more presidential elections. But most important for our purposes tonight, she is a respected biographer of women charting their own paths in the context of their times. Her two previous books, The Matriarch, a biography of Barbara Bush, and Madam Speaker, a best-selling biography of Nancy Pelosi, fill in important blanks of history with more complete stories about some of America's leading women. Women who, despite their visibility, have often been unsung, undervalued, and misunderstood. In her new book, Susan turns her attention away from politics and focuses on her own trade, journalism. This time she takes a fresh and rigorous look at Barbara Walters, a female trailblazer in broadcast journalism who became a household name over several decades, at once impressing, infuriating, confounding, and mostly inspiring millions of Americans. Generations have watched her incisive, some might say ruthless, uh, interviews of global leaders like Vladimir Putin, Fidel Castro, and Anwar Sadat, and headline makers like Elizabeth Taylor, Mike Tyson, Donald Trump, and Monica Lewinsky. Uh, despite her extraordinary achievements, Walters, like many successful and ambitious women, has often been rendered in one or two dimensions rather than in full 3D complexity. With the publication of Susan's book, though, we can now see Walters through a more panoramic lens, a public figure examined more thoroughly, and as one reviewer said, more compassionately. And I just want to say how important it is what Susan Page is doing with her books. She really is helping us arrive at a broader, richer, and more accurate story of these women, and in so doing, of our broader society. And it's just really important that we finally have the full stories and perspectives and experiences of women not caricatured and not treated superficially and indifferently. Um, in conversation with Susan tonight, we're delighted and honored to be joined by another award-winning journalist, Dana Bash. Dana is familiar to anyone who follows American politics or watches CNN, where she's chief political correspondent, uh, co an anchor of Inside Politics, co-anchor of State of the Union, and a frequent moderator of presidential debates in CNN town halls. She also conducts in-depth interviews with a cross-section of Americans for a series called Being. Uh, like Susan, Dan is a great friend of PNP, and we're always grateful to have her in whatever capacity. Um, tonight, of course, she's the moderator. And I just want to say, I don't know about you, but I saw her on TV a lot already today. She's been on the air for hours already, and it's still only 7 o'clock. Um, Dana, we are so appreciative that you were able to carve out time for this event amidst everything else that you're trying to do journalistically. I think we're in for a really wonderful conversation. So please join me in welcoming Susan Page and Dana Bash. Hello. How is everybody? I'm looking for my parents. I don't see them. Where are they? Oh, there they are. OK, hi. <laughs> um, thank you so much for asking me to do this. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to it's do such, it. It's such an honor. And um, wow. I mean, talk about a lot of copy, as a, uh, a famous author once said. And. Um, 
I actually, of course, we're going to talk all about Barbara Walters, but I do want to pick up where you left off. And I was thinking about this coming over here. Barbara Bush, Nancy Pelosi, Barbara Walters. Was there, a, like, a, to quote Oprah, an aha moment when you said, <laughs> I'm going to do books and biographies and talk for history's sake about really famous w women in a more fulsome way? So I wish the answer to that was yes, because I would look smarter than I than I am. But and before I answer the question, first I have to thank you for being here. To thank Lissa and Brad for and politics and prose, the best friend and author or readers ever had. So thank you, thank you very much. So I, I have I think Donald Trump to thank as as we do for so many things because when he was uh, uh, inaugurated in 2017. Uh, and I was uh, writing for USA Today, as I, as I continue to do, um, I just had to do something that did not involve writing about Donald Trump. And so I went on a halftime book leave from USA Today and continued to write about Donald Trump, as I do to this day, but with the idea of writing, writing a book. And shrewdly, I suggested, I met with uh, uh, Robin Sproul, who is here in the audience, the former bureau chief for ABC, who is quoted in this book with the most single delicious story in the book. I'll leave you to find it. She's in the index, so if you buy one, you'll be able to find it. And uh, it, with her, I uh, met with, she was working with Javelin, uh, my, became my agent. And I sat down with them for a, a breakfast in, in, uh, in 2017 and proposed all books about men. <laughs> and they said those books all sounded pretty boring. And, <laughs> and what about Barbara Bush? And now, in fact, I had covered Barbara Bush in multiple campaigns with her with campaigns of her husband and of, of her sons, and, and I'd interviewed her any number of times. And the thing that was interesting to me about Barbara Bush was that the people had this image of Barbara Bush that was completely at odds with who Barbara Bush really was. And uh, she had an, an image of being kind of grandmotherly and nice, and she was, in fact, kind of mean and uh, really shrewd and powerful in ways I think she didn't show people. And so I actually just took the advice of my agent and embarked on a book about Barbara Bush. But then I found that women were really interesting. And I discovered that women are, in fact, less likely to have biographies written of them than men with whom they have equivalent careers. And that didn't seem right. And so now, you know, third time around, still looking at women, and it's it's more deliberate now than it was when I started out. So Barbara, Nancy, Barbara, who's your next Nancy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you'll just suggest okay, a good. Nancy that's okay. worth doing. First of all, I didn't know that's such a great story, Robin. I love that. Uh, I will just say, just side note, that after the 2016 election, I sat down with some of my colleagues and said, how do I need a, a soul um, fulfilling project? And I started a, uh, a digital series, which is now on TV occasionally called Badass Women of Washington. So this is, as they say, fate for shared. And Nancy Pelosi, one of your badass women. She, yes, of she Washington. was. I got yeah. to walk around. You uh, walked around Baltimore, Baltimore with, with her. her. And I think you had ice cream with her, didn't I you? I did. Yeah, it yes. was uh, quite she memorable. Said, she said, Dark chocolate, then milk chocolate, never white chocolate, because what's the point? So here's here's something you had to okay. do a, a biography of, of Nancy Pelosi for to under to realize. One is that the only thing in her freezer at her apartment ice cream. is ice cream, mm -hmm. is chocolate ice cream. That's all she eats. And what does she have for lunch every day of the week when she's on Capitol Hill? A hot dog. A hot dog. I mean, she eats like a child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she has a hot dog. She has choc chocolate ice cream for breakfast, and she has a hot dog for mm -hmm. lunch. You know who didn't have hot dogs for lunch? Barbara Walters. <laughs> you know, you're slightly wrong. Oh, really? Did Let she me, eat hot yeah, dogs? Yeah. So Barbara Walters, for years, Barbara Walters had no domestic skills. Like, she couldn't cook. Uh, and uh, she had many other skills, but... Uh, and for years, until she became pretty well established and wealthy, she would have bologna sandwiches for dinner. Is that right? Okay. So it's it's hot dog adjacent. Um, there's so much to unpack here. And I, I just want to 
talk big picture, which is just like you said, when um, you kind of look at the person who you're going to do a biography about from the outside, they look like a certain thing and you think they are a certain way. And one of my overall takeaways is that she was, we're going to talk all about her accomplishments, but just in terms of her as a person, she was never satisfied, not happy, and actually quite sad. And it made me sad. Yeah. You know, she, um, uh, she, Barbara Walters did not aspire to work-life balance. She aspired to work. And three husbands took second to place to her work, and her daughter took second place to her work, uh, and her friends took second place to her work. Um, she once said, <laughs> I love this quote, she was getting a big Lifetime Achievement Award in L.A., and she, she was waxing in a happy way about this career she had had. And she said, you know, you can have children, but they grow up and move away. But fame and fortune, all this, this is forever. <laughs> now, this is, by the way, I believe, not true. <laughs> and actually, and, that was true. I mean, the end of her life was quite proved lonely what you just and said. Isolated. And it was the opposite of what Barbara Bush had said. Because you may remember she gave a commencement address at Smith uh, and said, at the end of your life, you'll never wish, oh, I wish I had taken on one more lawyer's court case. You'll, you'll never wish... Uh, I took one more test. You'll wish I'd spent more time with the people I love. So they really had polar opposite views about what really matters in life. But Barbara, Barbara Walters loved um, what she achieved. She loved being famous. She loved being in the middle of the national conversation. She loved getting the big interview and scoring the highest uh, ratings possible. Uh, and she loved having a lot of money. Um, but she did not have, the richness of her professional life was not matched by her personal life. And uh, in the last several years of her life, when she was uh, much more seriously ill than, than had, was acknowledged in public, um, she was uh, uh, basically living uh, in her fabulous Fifth Avenue apartment, but she wouldn't go across the street to Central Park because she didn't want there to be a picture of her in a wheelchair. Uh, and she wouldn't let her, even her very people who'd been extremely close friends in the past come and see her because she wanted to be remembered in her prime, interviewing uh, despots and presidents and Monica Lewinsky and actors and murderers, not as this diminished figure uh, toward the end of her life. So let's start at the beginning of her life or when she was younger and... Um the fact that she didn't come into journalism as a, uh, as a, as a journalist. I mean, she came into journalism through uh, show business, through her father. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, about Lou Walters. And this was, so Lou Walters was uh, one of the great impresarios of his generation. He, he started out booking vaudeville acts. Um, he started, he created some nightclubs, including the Latin Quarter, Quarter which was one of the Big draws in New York, big tourist draws in New York City. Did anybody here ever go to the Latin Quarter? What? How? How was it? Was <laughs> you know, that's not really the sign of a good interview. If uh, the person just gives you a good as the answer, did you? Was Lou Walters there? So he, what he promised you, people who came there, was a big steak at a reasonable price. And lots of showgirls in scanty dress. Is that what he delivered? He definitely delivered the showgirls. <laughs> <laughs> so he was he would be enorm Lou Walters was enormously successful. He would get he would he would earn millions and millions of dollars and then he would gamble it away on gin rummy. Uh, and he he would go he would have these huge successes and then these catastrophic failures. And any of you with children will know that is not really the prescription for raising secure children, to have them be living in a penthouse uh, at one point and then to be moved back to a rental 
in Miami at another uh, to to have every all the money you could possibly have and then worry about uh, how you're going to get through uh, the next day. So um, this was th this uh, from her father's. I think she gathered uh, a sense of what people wanted to hear. You know, people wanted a big stake in in and showgirls, people wanted interesting people to be performing for them. Uh, but she also had a sense, earned, got this sense that you couldn't count on anything. Nothing was forever. You could be at the top of the world and make a single misstep and lose it all. And then she was 28 years old. She had just gone through her first divorce. Mm -hmm. And uh, her father attempted suicide. And you write that she instantly understood she was in charge now, responsible for her bankrupt father, her anxious mother, which I want you to talk about, and her disabled sister and herself. Her deep-seated insecurity about the future would fuel her fierce ambition and create a hunger that was never really satisfied. Yeah. Talk about the rest of her family. Yeah, so her, her dad I just talked about, her mother was uh, unhappy, always worried that, uh, convinced that, her fa that uh, Lou Walters was going to come to a bad end. Uh, not a not a happy marriage, um, and her sister, who was a couple years older than she was, her sister Jackie, was developmentally disabled. Um, never went to an extended period of time to any school. Never worked, um, and was cons and really consumed um, all of much of her mother's attention. So uh, Barbara Walters felt that she grew up really without a childhood, without parents. Her father was always gone. She said she could not remember ever hugging her father. Uh, and her mother consumed with the care of her older sister. There was a point when she was in elementary school where she found that if she complained that she had terrible stomach aches, she would get her mother for a day. Her mother would take her to a doctor for tests. Uh, and so she, her stomach, she, her stomach in fact did not hurt. But she made such a compelling case that it did that she eventually had her appendix out because the doctors, of course, couldn't find what was wrong with her because nothing was wrong with her except that she wanted more attention from her parents. And this this made me, number one, this seems like bad medical care. Uh, like, like it can't just be, okay, we'll take your appendix out. I think that was odd. But also, how could there be no one in this little girl's life who understood what the stomach aches represented. As they say, it was a different time. Yeah. And there's, I actually want to get back to that with a whole series of things that happened in her life that would have been so different if it were today. Talk about when Barbara Walters first became Barbara Walters. It was at NBC. So in, uh, so she had, uh, she decided she had been, had no particular direction at the point her father uh, tried to commit suicide, but she had a direction as soon as that was over because she felt she had to be the both the emotional base for this family and also provide the financial support. And she ended up getting a job first with a CBS morning show that was short-lived and then uh, w with a te temporary contract with NBC's Today Show. Then she became the girl writer for the NBC Today Show because the Today Show employed only one woman on the writing staff to write for women who would be on the air, because God knows men and women don't speak the same, so they couldn't possibly write for men. Um, and she just worked relentlessly to get herself on the air. And she succeeded She succeeded in doing that. Uh, Hugh Downs was the host of the Today Show. Who remembers Hugh Downs? Yeah. Hey, everybody. And he is the exception to the rule in this story because he was really the only man uh, on the air in TV in this early part of her career who pulled for Barbara Walters, who th saw her value and who supported her. Uh, then he left and he was replaced by Frank McGee. Does anyone remember Frank McGee? Okay. So Frank McGee had no regard for Barbara Walters, uh, possibly no regard for women generally. And he found her very annoying. And he went to the head of the network uh, head of the network news division and said, I want to have a rule that when we're interviewing someone, I'll ask the first three questions and Barbara cannot speak until I did that. And the network agreed to it. Can you imagine? So 
Uh, she would sit there, and Frank McGee would ask the first three questions. I mean, how humiliating. But can you just go back a little bit? And I jumped ahead. How did she go from being the girl writer to being on TV? Well, she was the girl writer for... Uh, for a time for a, for a kind of celebrity who had gotten uh, this contract to do uh, a, a program sponsored by SNH, Great Green Stamps, which kind of directed at women. And she, this, this, this woman would see Barbara, her writer, uh, in, off, off the air, like mouthing her words, like so eager to be on the air that it's... And, and so she was helpful. She sent Barbara to a speech coach and... And Barbara just wormed her way on. She she would offer to do pieces um, like uh, uh, riding bikes in Central Park was one of the early ones she did. She eventually did one about going undercover as a Playboy bunny. Uh, uh, this was a I remember that. This was a story she liked so much that her her final tweet before she went off Twitter was reposting. A picture of herself. Maybe that's why bunny. I remember. Yeah. It. yeah, yeah. She was. She she liked that. But it was. Here's the thing to remember: no woman had ever done this before. No woman had ever gotten herself um, on the Today Show. She eventually, as the the co-host, when Frank McGee died, no woman had gotten on the evening news as she did in 1976 when she went to ABC. She had no model, and she had no mentors, and she did it by just. And she was not generally not welcome. Uh, a lot of skepticism from the people who were running TV news and the other and the men who were on TV news. And she just pushed her way in. And then the pull over to ABC, which was a big, big deal. The quote unquote million dollar baby. Yeah. Million dollar baby. Uh, there's nothing insulting about that in any way. I mean, it's uh, yeah, totally yeah, fine. Really, yeah. <laughs> Um, so she wanted to be the evening anchor because that was the pinnacle, at least at that time. I don't know. Is it still the pinnacle? It's the pinnacle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it was definitely the pinnacle then. Um, uh, the pinnacle. Laura O'Donnell just interviewed the Pope. I know. So an I interview, think that answers your question. An interview Barbara Walters spent years trying to get, yeah. not with this Pope, but with any Pope. Yeah. 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 That was, it was really impressive. Was impressive. How, how did she do that? Practice, practice, practice. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Never give up. Um, uh, I forget what I was saying because it was oh, so... Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, she wanted About to be the evening moving anchor. Moving to ABC. Right, right. And uh, NBC wouldn't make her the evening anchor uh, because even though Dick Wald, who was then head of the news division, had been a big supporter and friend of Barbara Walters, he didn't think she would, in fact, be very good as the evening anchor. Uh, so they refused to give her that job. And ABC was running third in the ratings, um, and had basically nothing to lose. And they paid her a million dollars to do the evening news with Harry Reasoner, who threatened to quit, and four specials a year. And so she had this job she wanted. And you know what? Dick Wald turned out to be kind of right. Uh, being an anchor was not her strength. Her strength was doing get landing and then doing these big interviews with all sorts of interesting people. But anyway, she finally... She finally had uh, the job she wanted. I have to read. Um, now, I think this was, I don't know if this was Reasoner or who, who did the commentary? Not, so Reasoner, it, Reasoner did all this comment, incredibly sexist. Oh, Howard oh, K. Smith. It's Howard K. Smith. Yeah, okay. Yeah. He called Walters, quote, network television's first female anchor man, a lady whose beauty sometimes disguises, I think he said this on the air. Yes. He says this on the air. Okay, and we just start again. <laughs> Called Walters, quote, network television's first female anchor man, a lady whose beauty sometimes disguises a talent rarely equaled in this craft. He noted that women were making inroads in other jobs in TV as well. Quote, now on this report, I will answer to a lady anchor man, Barbara, he said, referring to his continuing role as the show's occasional commentator. Quote, any bruise to the male ego is assuaged by the thought that if you've got to go, then being a male island and it being a male island in a sea of pretty women, well, what a way to go. And on he, TV. And what's amazing is he was the friendly one. <laughs> 
He was the one on her side. Harry Reasoner was the one who really was out to to uh, to kill her. You know, Hiller, Harry Reasoner, um, uh, who came across, you know, his image was kind of avuncular, but in fact he was lazy and a drunk, and did not pay, uh, and did not um, want to share the anchor table with anybody, and especially not with a woman, and especially not with Barbara Walters, and they had to stop doing. They had to st- is it, they had to stop doing two shots. You know what a two shot is? It's where it's the camera angle where you see the anchor talking and you can see the other person listening to the anchor talking. And how and Harry Reasoner would look so we'd be scowling, would look openly contemptuous of Barbara Walters while she spoke on the air. So they just stopped doing the two shots. It was so bad that that women across the country were writing in complaining about how what Harry Reasoner was doing and. ABC created a form letter that said, you know, dear viewer, uh, you know, we're so sorry that you're upset about what's happening on the evening news, but we hope you'll stick around and continue to tune in. Uh, the ratings were, in fact, not very good. And uh, Rune Arledge was hired to take over uh, the, uh, the news division. And uh, Harry Reasoner went back to CBS and Barbara Walters was edged back in a very courteous way to doing the big interviews that she did so well. So she did the big interviews that she did so well. And then, well, talk a little bit about like her approach to landing the big interview. And then I want to talk about the rivalry. So you know something about booking big interviews. What is the secret to booking big interviews? Just working hard and being relentless but I think it's a lot easier when you call and you say, hi, it's Barbara Walters. <laughs> well, eventually, of course, she was more famous than all the people she was interviewing, which gave it kind of a weird dynamic to some of those interviews. But um, the, she, did, she just worked, she worked it and worked it and worked it. And she cultivated newsmakers and their fathers and their lawyers. And, uh, and she just, she, she was never not, working for the next interview. And she took a, she took the long view. I mean, she did work on popes for years and years. Um, Mark Chapman, uh, the man who assassinated John Lennon, it took her 10 years to get the interview with him. She would go to him, write him letters in prison as the, each year as the anniversary of the shooting approached. And after 10 years, he finally, he finally agreed. That was that was her approach. She was just, um, she, she, and, and the more famous she got, the easier it became. But still, things like the Monica Lewinsky interview, which was the highest ratings for any interview um, on a single network in the history of American television. She spent a year working that and working against Oprah and uh, Diane Sawyer and everybody else uh, in American journalism trying to land that, that interview. But it's landing the interview, that's one thing. But then, of course, it's conducting the interview, which is the thing that she did so brilliantly, which is what got her the next interview and the next interview after that. And it's figuring out what is the question everybody wants to have answered. That's what she, she would ask everybody. She would have a big interview coming up. Uh, and if, so if she, if she had the, Mon- if she was doing this and the Monica Lewinsky interview was coming up, she would ask you all, what do you want me to ask Monica Lewinsky? Uh, and she she did the, she, she had the note cards right she had the note cards the she would take these three by five note cards and write a question on it and have a big stack of them and she would brainstorm with her staff about what is the question to ask how should the question be asked to get an answer in what order should the questions be asked because she tried to get for these big interviews she tried to have an an arc where she do something at the beginning to grab you and then a narrative of a story, and then some kind of kicker at the end. And you know the other thing she would do? She would make people cry. I mean, it almost became a joke, but, but uh, and people would come on saying, I'm not going to make you cry, and then they would start to cry. Was uh, that something that she thought through, or it just happened once and she decided this is my thing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's more, if she, Barbara Walters was doing an interview, it was probably at a time of high emotion, Either 
you had just been convicted of murder or you'd been elected president, something had happened, something big had happened which made you worth interviewing. And so naturally, if somebody is there asking the question that tries to get to the core of what's going on, maybe it's not surprising people would react in an emotional way. Have you ever made anyone cry on the air? I don't think so. No. You should work on it. You really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, why don't you come on with me next yeah, week? Yeah, I did start to cry. cry. Yeah. Um, Diane Sawyer. No. Oh. The way that you write about this rivalry and the candor with which Diane Sawyer spoke with you about their incredibly complicated relationship is stunning. Absolutely stunning. I want you to talk about that, but I just want to um, put a little bit of a backdrop out there for the audience, which this just blew me away. One example of, so Diane Sawyer, came to, well, you can tell, she, she came to ABC. Uh, Barbara Walters was not very happy about that uh, from CBS, and it was a big coup, and, she, and, and the two of them really competed for big interviews. And one example of how intense it was, um, Diane had an interview with somebody, Root. I don't remember who that is. Tom Root. Tom Root. Yeah. And He's been lost in time. Okay. But, yeah. Well, it was a big deal at the yeah. time. And somebody from Barbara's staff, her booker, went to the hotel and, and like cornered this person and literally said and tried to steal it. You don't want to do the interview with Barbara. You got to do, go uh, with uh, Diane. You got to do it with Barbara. I just want to say for the record, if I did that, I would rightly be fired, <laughs> like on the spot. But at ABC, Rune Arledge, he stoked it. He thought the more competition, the better, because they'll work harder and we'll get better guests and higher ratings. The story's even worse than that, because what had happened was Diane had been hired, and uh, and and what was a huge coup. And um, Barbara saw it as a betrayal, because they both did the same thing, tried to get big interviews. But in her view, Diane was, yo Diane was younger, 16 years younger. Diane was prettier. Uh, Diane, you know, Diane was smoother, um, you know, not so much in your face like uh, Barbara was. And Tom Root was the, the highlighted interview in the first show that Diane Sawyer was doing on ABC. He was this pilot who had uh, was on a plane and allegedly passed out and then all these it became a big it was like the OJs on the freeway other planes following him and finally he crashed into the ocean and he's rescued and it turns out he's got a gun wound in his uh, wound, you know, he's been shot in the stomach it was a big mystery none of you remember it now because who cares but at that moment that week for that show it was incredibly important it was the biggest interview that Diane had booked for her first show and the night before the interview uh, they put him up in a New York Tom Root up in a New York hotel, and they uh, Diane's staff smartly stationed someone in the lobby of the hotel on the theory that someone from another network might try to get Tom Root. And instead, here comes in a booker for Barbara Walters trying to do that very same thing. It was wow. not successful. It was not successful, but you know, not for trying. You know, my other, another favorite Barbara story is, so she wants, so it's the Camp David talks, right? With, uh, with President Clinton and Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin. And they bring up the, the, they bring up the press that's like kept uh, miles away in the nearest local town to, to, to take some pictures and get some color. And when the bus, press bus is pulling away, they discover that they're one short, one reporter is not on the bus, and it turned. And they finally find Barbara Walters hiding in a, this, a stall of a bathroom, because her theory, I guess, and the, you know, the, the security is pretty tight at Camp David, so Barbara, Barbara Walters' theory was if she could only like get the other reporters to go away, she could come out and maybe get an interview with who knows who. Can you imagine? How'd they get her out of there? Well, they they refused to let anyone leave until apparently the Secret Service took it seriously, and they refused to let any of the reporters leave until Barbara had been 
uh, Barbara had been found. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> but Diane talked about, yes, obviously they had a very intense rivalry, but they also had a deep bond, yeah. which I love. Yeah, I mean, they had layers. Um, and they were brutal to one another. I mean, initially, Barbara to Diane, although Diane could be pretty tough, too. Um, but there were very few people in a position to understand what their lives were like than each other, what it was like to be groundbreaking women in a tough business. Uh, so it wasn't that, that, that it was a relationship that had... Um, you know, hatred, maybe that's not the right word, but fierce rivalry, but also some uh, empathy with one another. And Diane talked to me particularly about how wistful Barbara could be with her because Diane had this successful marriage with Mike Nichols, and Barbara never had a successful marriage. She never had a successful marriage. She obviously had a tough relationship with her parents, which, which we talked about. She adopted uh, a girl that she never had a great relationship with uh, either. Um, and it just. Do you know who facilitated the adoption? Who? Roy Cohn. Okay, so that was the other thing I was going to ask you about her, her friendship with oh, Roy Cohn. Yeah. It lasted longer than any of her marriages. Uh, they met when she was 25. He repeatedly proposed to her. And went, I know, amazing, you need to buy this book. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, hold on. Roy Cohn was gay. Closeted gay man. He's closeted, yeah. okay. And I think there wasn't, uh, I think it took even Barbara a little while to understand that he was a closeted gay man because there was a point where she seriously considered accepting his proposal. That would have been probably a fourth unsuccessful marriage, but <laughs> who knows. Um, but she had a, I mean, she had a, uh, Roy, and so Roy Cohn facilitated the adoption of this infant, this newborn girl. Uh, and also when her father got in legal trouble and a warrant was out for his arrest for non-payment of taxes in New York, Roy Cohn made it disappear. <laughs> we think it wasn't like a legal process that he used. Uh, he make it disappear or a person disappear? <laughs> <laughs> made, the, made the legal problem disappear. Uh, so, you know, Roy, Roy Cohn, part of, part of the Barbara Walters story. So interesting. So the, I want to open it up to the audience, but what I was thinking about a lot in this very complicated and fantastic life of this woman is she broke so much ground for so many of us. And so many of the things that she struggled with in her personal life would be so much easier in modern times for her, her sister, uh, who, as you said, was developmentally disabled, would have had better care. Uh, her, uh, the fact that she had trouble conceiving, maybe she would have had the trouble, but science is different now. And all of the things that she struggled with, and not to mention the obvious professionally, that she, she didn't have any mentors, she didn't have any role models, there was no seeing it so you could be it. She was the it. And so much of that um, would be so different now, but that she she really did. I mean, you kind of throw throw around the notion of somebody being a trailblazer or a, a glass ceiling breaker. I mean, she was it. And, you know, she, she did it for herself, not for us, but she helped every woman who followed her. Yeah, she... Uh, yeah. she for her, when, when girls would come up to her and say, I want to be you, she said, well, you got to be the whole package, which included a dysfunctional childhood, a father she couldn't remember hugging her, a disabled sister, three failed marriages, and a, a daughter who was estranged. And she savored her success, uh, but she was uh, incredibly elusive and then withdrew into bitterness, which is quite sad. You know, now, um, like, I ask you to do this to... My, to, you know, to be my conversation partner here, and you have other things to do, and you work very hard, and particularly with this, the, all these trials going on, uh, but you said yes, uh, because uh, I think women uh, journalists like to support one another. Very much so. And 
that is like so big a help in our careers and our lives and figuring out how to, how to have, um, uh, rich lives that bring us satisfaction and joy. It makes a difference, but there was no sisterhood for, for Barbara Walters. Sisterhood is a uh, gift that Barbara Walters gave us by clearing a path that a lot of women could then follow so that there'd be enough women so we wouldn't all see each other as fierce rivals. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name's Eli. Nice, thank you for coming. Uh, my question is, you've talked about how uh, Barbara Walters was, land big interviews and did them very well. Um, today in the tr time of Trump and all this chaos, when media is trying to figure out like how to balance interviewing Trump and Trump associates and things like that, while also trying to get the truth out without platforming people that are lying to the American public, how would you, as a journalist yourself, and also knowing Barbara Walters, figure out a way to do that, I guess? It's, it's, that's a great question, Eli. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's such a different time. You know, one reason we made the subtitle of the book The Life and Times of Barbara Walters is because um, it reflects the times for women uh, in journalism and in culture. It also reflects the times for the news media then, when the three networks uh, could decide who had a platform and who didn't. Where if you, if you uh, were uh, a celebrity, uh, famous or infamous, you were either going to do an interview with the networks or you weren't going to get the kind of uh, coverage, reach people the way you wanted to. That's not the case anymore. There, there are a million ways to reach an audience now that gives more control to the newsmakers and less to the journalists. So it, that's one thing that's, that struck me is how different the media landscape is and how, um, how we have, in many ways, I think, less power to impose our sense, our judgment on who deserves a platform and who doesn't. It's, and it's definitely one of the th issues that has made us um, try to think through how we cover Donald Trump that is, uh, is respectful and thorough, um, but, but applies you know, standards of, of fact-checking and context uh, that covering him has demanded. Did you, do you have anything you want to add? No. No. Thank you. Um, my uncle, uh, Jerry Raker, was the one who actually hired Barbara Walters with uh, CBS Radio in New York. Could you talk a little bit more about that period? Well, no, you tell me. Don't, don't walk away. <laughs> Where were you when I was working on this book? <laughs> what, what did he tell you about it? Um, well, he mentioned about her, uh, the way, her distinctive way of talking, um, like a lisp or something. Yeah. Um, but Actually, do you talk about that in your book? Yeah. Can you talk about that? Because particularly for, I mean, now you don't need to have the sort of the pipes. It's just, it's very different. But then for radio and television, you did. And not just the pipes, but her speech impediment. Yeah. And the fact that that did not stop her. And mm. in fact, it became a, a hallmark of Barbara Walters is pretty remarkable. It, it is, but it was a, seen as a problem. It didn't help her get hired. Uh, it didn't help her get on the air that she had this anomaly. It, some call it a lisp. I'm not sure that's exactly right. But she And she called it a Boston accent, which it was definitely not true. Uh, <laughs> and she, she went um, to, it's more than once she would go to speech coaches to try to get rid of it. And she was never, she was never able to get, to get rid of it. Uh, um, so in that way, she wasn't a natural in the air. It was like one more thing she she overcame. Um, the, the, the one of the things that um, uh, one of the guys who was doing hiring for CBS at the time she got this first writing job there was that he hired her because she had the cutest ass. That tracks, as the yeah. kids say. Um, so it gives you a little sense of, uh, I'm sure this wasn't your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> or do you think it might have been? Uh, uh, but it gives you, a, I mean, and this was the kind of stuff that she was putting up with every day of the week. Uh, it's exhausting. Uh, and we don't have exactly a perfectly level playing field now, but she put up with stuff that would get 
people fired now. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Nathan Weisler, and I'm a, and I'm a recent graduate of Montgomery College here in the Washington area. Um, in 2020, you inscribed my copy of the Barbara Bush book by mail, and your your kindness and generosity in doing that has been important in my journey, and is something that I'll, and is something that I remember is something that I remember and appreciate. And um, my question is. Um, would you be able to speak some about um, the role that Judaism played in Barbara Walters' life? I read some about, I started reading about her uncle Harry and Aunt Minna, and also about her grandfather who was born in Poland, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, I, um, I was wondering if you might be able to speak a little bit about that, and um, what do you think is the most significant aspects of her Jewish heritage and, and the role that that played in her life? Thank you. Thank you for buying a second book. You know, <laughs> um, you know, she uh, uh, she she was uh, her ancestors uh, were from the what was in the Russian Empire along, along the Polish border in that general area and fled because uh, of the uh, pogroms uh, that Jewish people there were were suffering. Um, and so that's why she, that her family ended up why her family ended up in the United States. Um, but she insisted that her Judaism meant nothing to her. Um, her family was not observant. Uh, her uncle was, uh, but her father was not. And they would have uh, Friday night dinners, but they wouldn't say the traditional prayers. They didn't attend a synagogue. Um, and she, uh, she did, you know that show, The Roots, that's on PBS? She was actually featured on the first one of those shows. And, and the... DNA analysis they did then that seemed so remarkable and that which probably everybody in this room has had done now uh, found that she was 99% Jewish so she was definitely Jewish but she said on that show that it that it hadn't played any role with her she dismissed it as an, an influence in her life I'm, I'm sure it had influence uh, but it didn't have influence that she acknowledged First of all, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Uh, this is as engaging as just about anything I can remember. Uh, and that last question, I think, might actually be a good antecedent to mine, which is um, all through this, I've been thinking about Barbara Walters' on-air persona. And it's almost like a tape's been playing of the various appearances. And the adjectives that come to mind are measured and empathetic, good humor. Ironically, by, uh, as I put all that together, I think, well, she probably would have been a pretty good mom kind of the kind of person who would listen and be caring. So my question is, uh, if that was the real Barbara Walters, where did it come from? Uh, and if not, I don't mean to sound cruel, but it almost sounds like she was a fake. So first, is there a Barbara Walters interview that is your favorite, or that you remember really fondly, or that you thought was especially good? I think it was really just the continuum, which, which in a way is a compliment because she was also very even uh, and very predictable. You sort of knew what you were going to get. There wasn't going to be anything ugly or, or poorly handled. Yeah. She was going to be prepared. Did she ever interview Sadat? Oh, she did, yeah, yes. That's, that's probably the one then. You know, well, she would, The yeah. Fidel Castro one is... Yeah. But Fidel Castro, that was a big one. Some people said they were more than friends. <laughs> I couldn't prove that one way or the other. It is true that some people Did you say try? that. Yes. Oh my goodness! I spent a lot of energy pursuing the Fidel Castro angle. Wow. Uh, <laughs> because wouldn't it have been great if I could have answered the question? Mm -hmm. uh, but they were. They had this. They had a real spark. They were. They were definitely friends. The question, more than friends, that one I could. That one I couldn't answer. You know, the thing about being a, a mother, is that she was not a fake, but. I think she liked the idea, the idea of being a mother, and the picture that being a mother would give her as being more fulfilled as a woman. Maybe that was how it was seen at the time. Uh, but she didn't like the reality of being a mother. So she adopts this newborn um, and hires, uh, in short order, a, a live-in nanny and a live-out housekeeper. And she thinks that's enough. So she doesn't really, she effectively doesn't curtail her career in any way because she knows her daughter will be well cared for at her apartment. But we know that children expect more than that from parents. They want their parents to be around in a 
more seriously. They want to sometimes come first in their parents' lives. Um, so being a, a parent was, uh, I think, problematic for her. And uh, where is her daughter now? How did that story? Her daughter start? lives in Florida, um, and has uh, with who? Uh, she her daughter's had two uh, marriages, two divorces, but has now in a long term relationship uh, with a man, although they haven't actually uh, gotten married. But her daughter's very private. Um, uh, and one thing her daughter did that um, I'm that I'm like sorry about. Like, because in a way, you want to be on Barbara's side at the end of her life because she did so much and had s some pain too. Um, her her daughter um, didn't want to have a big memorial service for her mother because her daughter hated her, her daughter was not a social figure, did not New York society, not her not her thing. And I really thought Diane deserved. I'm um, Diane. Barbara does. Diane is not dead. <laughs> that that Barbara d deserved and would have wanted a big send off. Well, not only that, I remember when she died, it was 2022, and it was December, it was like Christmas Eve? December 30th. Oh, New Year, almost New Year's Eve. So for someone like her to, to pass away when the subs are anchoring, I mean, I'm serious, right, Robin? Like, and for them to be the, like the subs of the subs? For them to be the ones to announce that she passed away was like. And it made me want the big memorial service even more. Yeah. I mean, remember the one Tim Russert got here? Uh, that was great. Well, and, and, and Peter Jennings, Peter had, a, Jennings had a beautiful yeah. one. And uh, but her daughter, but her daughter uh, didn't want to do that. And ABC didn't want to do it without her daughter. Didn't feel like that would be appropriate. And her daughter had. Uh, had the burial also be very private, so that even some of Barbara's closest friends didn't know that Barbara would have. Barbara went to a million of those, uh, you know, celebrations of other people's lives. I think she would have liked to have one herself. Uh, could you talk about the, what led up to her first interview, sort of the launching pad, and what was who was the baptismal interview? And then also talk about the last one, the uh, beginning and the end. Yeah. Please. So <clears throat> the she she did a bunch of she did a million interviews for the Today Show, but the the Castro interview was like her comeback interview after she failed basically as the at the evening news, and that was a that was a great interview. Her last interview also really interesting. She was um, this was actually she, she was eighty two years old. The Arab Spring was blowing up. Diane had been told that she could have the interview. They, she should go after the interview with um, uh, uh, Assad, the president of Syria. Um, who everyone was trying to go after an interview with him, and they were trying to handle interviews in a more um, uh, mannerly way at ABC. So, what does Barbara do at 82? Is she goes and grabs, gets that interview away from Diane. <laughs> she works the system. She becomes friends with the daughter of the. Uh, Syrian ambassador to the United Nations facilitates. So she lands at 82, this fantastic interview. She goes to Damascus, which is the scene of great violence, and she does a really tough interview with Assad. She asks Assad every hard question. Um, she, when she shows Assad pictures of people who had been tortured by Syrian forces. Uh, and it was, it was, it was, Amazing. I bet Assad was regretting. Yes, Assad down with was her not happy. Point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other thing she did when she was in, they were in Damascus is, you know, the the security is pretty intense when somebody like Barbara Walters goes to do an interview in a place like Damascus during wartime, during a civil war, um, and the security oversight had told her, just go to the hotel, stay in the hotel, then go do the interview and leave. Right. So she, she gets in the hotel, and then suddenly she, they, they, there's a, they alert the head of a, the ABC News division that Barbara has left the hotel because she's shopping in the soup. She's <laughs> buying shawls and jewelry. And, My kind of girl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I just, as you're talking, we're almost out of time, but I'm, I'm also thinking, and I hope he doesn't get mad at me for telling you this, but 
Um, David Chalian, who I work with, who's our political director, was at ABC and worked uh, with Barbara and was one of the people who um, told me, I think maybe my dad who's here, who worked at ABC for many years. Your dad should also. stand up. Come on. Stu. Hey. <laughs> Hey. Um, that she would do the index card. You know, card. by the way, I tried to interview yeah. Stu for the book, and he never returned my yeah. emails. Well, <laughs> believe me, I've already chastised him about that. You're not. You're in good company. Ask him how many text messages he responds to from his daughter. No, it's okay. It's good technology. You know, um, but I. Uh, and so I. He, my dad has told me stories about the index cards. And, and David as well, and also about just sitting in a room with her and preparing for an interview and all these questions that she has. And in one of the meetings, she, she was going to ask a question, and he was like, eh, you don't need to really, you're not going to get a good, good answer. And then she looked at him because she was not just a, a great interviewer, but she was obviously a very good television producer, and she'd done it for so long. She said, it's the promo, David. <laughs> I need the question for the promo, David. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's so. So honestly, I think about that when I prepare for these for interviews as well. Like, it's, it's obviously about the, the answer. But sometimes it's about what you ask and how that's used for, in production when you, when you promote the interview. And the fact that she had done it so many times and she invented it and she was such a, a master at it and that was part of her prep process. So I think that was the interview with Sarah Palin after she had lost and uh, lost, you know, running for vice president with John McCain. And the question was, uh, at least this is a very similar story. The question was, will you run for president? And the people who were covering Sarah Palin said, she's already answered that question. She says, she's I think not this is run what this president. was. Yeah. And she said, no, it's for the promo. And so the promo just shows Barbara Walters going, and will you run for president? <laughs> exactly. And it doesn't show Sarah Palin giving the answer she had given a hundred times before. <laughs> Sounds right. I think, are we out of time? We are probably out of time. OK. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank, and thank you. you. Buy the book. Buy the book. Yeah. I just want to thank uh, Dana and Susan. What an incredible event. We could go on for hours, clearly. <laughs>